It's great to be here today. Hope you can hear me okay. And we've got lots of things to talk about today. And what I want to try to get you to do is to think about how different kinds of people think differently. When I was young, I thought everybody thought the same way I thought. I designed livestock equipment. Another mistake I made when I was in my 20s is I thought I could fix all the problems in the livestock industry with the right equipment. I can only fix half the problems. The other half of the problems you have to fix with the management. You have to have both the facilities and the management. And I thought everybody thought in pictures the way I did. And I have found out that not everybody thinks the same way. That sometimes when mistakes are made, it's not stupidity, it's different thinking. And I'm gonna show how different kinds of minds need to work together. Now, when does normal variation in personality become an abnormality? One of the big problems we've got in today's schools is if you've got the littlest, tiniest problem and want to get some special education, you're going to have to get a diagnosis. You know, dyslexia, ADHD, maybe a touch of autism or Asperger's. And the problem is, especially on these milder ends of the spectrum, I'm seeing too many people sort of becoming their diagnosis. I don't like it when nine-year-olds walk up to me and tell me about their autism instead of telling me that they, um, th they like to train dogs or would like medieval history or some other thing. Now, the thing is, a lot of these traits, um, you know, when does bipolar become just sort of geeky and creative? They're continuous traits. There's not a black and white dividing line between mild autism and geeks and nerds. It's basically all the same thing. Then there's more um, people with autism in technical careers. These diagnostic labels are not precise. It isn't like having an amputee and you, you know, or you can't walk or something like that. That's something that's much more precise. It's a behavioral profile. In fact, over the years, the Psychiatric Association keeps changing the behavioral profile. They took out the Asperger's, which was basically geeky and socially awkward with no speech delay. Autism, you had to have speech delay. Now it's one big mucky spectrum. And uh, you've got Silicon Valley put in with people that have a lot more handicaps. Now the thing that I wonder is, in today's school system, what's gonna happen to little Albert and little Stevie? You know, little Albert had no speech until age three. Likes to line up blocks, likes to play by himself. Sounds sort of like mild autism, doesn't it? How about little Stevie, a weird loner who brought snakes to his elementary school and turned them loose? Uh, that did not go over very well. And um, he was a filthy, dirty hippie that was so filthy that when he worked at Atari, they made him come in at night. He was teased in high school and bullied. And what saved him was the local neighborhood computer club. This is why I put so much emphasis on getting some of these kids that are kind of different involved in shared interests with peers. It could be programming computers. When I was in high school, it was model rocket club, horses, and electronics. And those were places where I was not teased. That's where I got peers, through the shared interests. Now, another thing I believe in doing is what I call silo busting. And I've made a definite, deliberate point, sort of, you know, not get too much into just the disability silo. Because when I go out to the Googleplex, oh, there's mild autism all over the place. Uh, they avoid the labels. They go to Montessori schools and they get apprenticed in. And I talked to a human resources um, person at another tech company, and she goes, oh, we know this, but we don't talk about it. Now, where a diagnosis can help some of these guys is on their relationships. That's where it can give a whole lot of insight. Now, you need to look at personality differences sort of like a music mixing board. You know, and you can adjust, okay, anxiety, slide it up and down. Maybe a brain can be made more social, or a brain can be made more thinking. You make a brain more thinking, you take out some social circuits. When does that become an abnormality? There's no black and white dividing line. This is one of the problems with things like dyslexia and autism. You know, probably 10 or 15 years ago, there was an article in Fortune magazine about dyslexic CEOs. You know, and then the guy who was the head of JetBlue at ADHD, great at getting things started, but not so good at operations. After that debacle they had at the Kennedy Airport and all the planes trapped out there in the snow, um, that's where they need somebody like me to make sure that that doesn't happen. Now, I am a visual thinker. I think completely in pictures. And I know some of you saw the HBO movie last night. It showed very clearly 
how I think in pictures. Now, when I was in my 20s, one of the mistakes I made is I thought everybody thought in pictures. Uh-uh, that's not the case. And being a visual thinker really helped me in my work designing livestock handling facilities. And you might wonder why I make it curved, because as you make it curved, as they go on around the curve, they go back to where they're coming from. And if you'd like to see how a modern beef plant works, you can go on YouTube and watch Beef Plant Video Tour with Temple Grandin, um, and you'll see how a modern beef plant works. Um, all right. Now, the thing is, when you're a really weird geek, you don't, you don't do that well in the interview process. you got to short-circuit that. What you need to be doing is show off your work. I learned to sell my work and not myself. I can remember going to an ag engineering meeting in 1974-75. I was a really weird geek back then, and I was so weird they didn't want to talk to me. But when I whipped out my drawings and I showed them my drawings, they go, oh, oh, you did that? You know, make portfolios of work. It could be computer programming. It could be mathematics. It could be artwork. It could be some writing. You want something that when somebody opens that up, they just go, wow. This person really can do things. You know, that's how I sold the jobs originally, showing people my portfolio. Now, I used to joke around that I had a huge internet circuit for visual thinking in my mind. And doing brain scans has been really kind of interesting, a journey to the center of my mind. And I go, yeah, I found out that I got a pretty big circuit in my mind for visual thinking. This visual circuit's probably in the you know, the top 20% or so. This is a normal circuit. I'm going to show you later on a real abnormal circuit that may also have quite a bit to do with visual thinking. And that is the circuit for speak what you hear. It's got a little tiny shrimpy circuit there. You see, in the brain, your gray matter's all around the outside. And then the whole middle part of the brain is like fiber optic cables that connect up different parts of the brain. And this is a fiber optic cable bundle for speak what you hear. And it has a stupid Latin name. I don't know what it is. But when you start looking at some of the Latin names of the parts of the um, brain, the uh, memory, uh, memory system is called the seahorse. I mean, really now? The emotion, sig uh, uh, emotion center in the brain is called the almond. Yep, not very, very uh, scientific. Now, this is a fiber bundle for speak. Speak what you see. This goes from the visual cortex up to the language areas of the brain. Okay, that shows a normal one. Now that is mine right there. Lots of extra bushes. And those extra bushes go all over the brain. Well, now, this is on a continuum. If you were to go out and scan 100 people, when does, how many extra bushes do you have to have for something to be abnormal? There's no black and white dividing line. It isn't something like you're in a wheelchair and you can't walk. It's not, it's not clear cut. And I get worried about some of the geeks and nerds getting a handicap mentality because I go over to the gifted conference and the same little geeks and nerds are there. And, and then I go to a seminar there and they're talking about social problems in the gifted. Oh, I go, oh, sounds like an autism meeting. And the thing that's bad about these silos is when I go out to the book tables, I go to a gifted conference book table. There might be 100 different books there. Autism book table, 100 different books, and there's almost no overlap in the books. That shows that people are staying in their silos. There should probably be 25% overlap in the books. And, and so these kids are going down different paths. And the problem we've got now with the autism diagnosis is we've got this huge mucky muck of a spectrum where Kids need a very different services on the high end than on the more severe end of the spectrum. Okay, now the price I paid for these extra bushes, which I think has something to do with having a language-based visual search engine, give me key words, pictures come up, just like in the movie, is I have less bandwidth or speak what I see. In other words, less fibers there. And when I was a little kid, I had trouble getting my speech out. And fortunately, I got into really good early intervention. I can't emphasize enough the importance of early inter intervention. By two and a half years old, I was in Miss Reynolds' speech school in Waltham, Massachusetts, 
She did a lot of the same kind of therapy they do today. Miss Reynolds invented the therapies they do today. You know, she was one of those older teachers that knew just sort of how hard to push. You've got to kind of push these kids a little bit, otherwise they just don't develop. Couldn't get that language out. I think now I'm doing okay on that. Now, this scan right here, uh, the blue part on that, that's basically full of water, full of cerebral spinal fluid. And you can see that I have an asymmetry. That kind of trashed out my math department. And I'm getting very worried about the educational fads we're in. Right now we're in an algebra fad. How would I get through college if I had to do algebra today? Well, back in 67, when I went to school, the fad at the time, and I thank the people that made the fads back in 67, it was finite math, probability, matrices, and statistics. And with 10 tons of tutoring, I was able to get through it. But the thing is, I'm going to show you why the world needs us visual thinkers. You know, we got to make sure the mathematical minds don't make some bad mistakes. Now, back in 68, up at Franklin Pierce College, I had access to the state-of-the-art IBM computer terminal that was tied into the University of New Hampshire mainframe. And I wanted to learn how to program the computer, but I just couldn't do it. You know, Malcolm Gladwell says if you have enough practice and enough access to services, you can do anything. I don't think that's true. I think a better way to look at it is, is when you get on extreme ability, or maybe an extreme more disability, innate matters more. Let's say this is the range, but in the middle here, you've got a music mixing board here in the middle, that's your brain plasticity. But you get on these far ends, like somebody's got extreme athletic ability. Now, yes, I agree with the practice. You've got to develop ability. I was talking to some people about a guy who took some welding classes, and he thought he could just go out and get a job. No, you've got to practice welding. You know, you're not going to learn that overnight. This is one of my most important slides the different kinds of minds. I am a photorealistic visual thinker. You know, for me to think about something, I think about it in very, very specific pictures. Algebra is totally impossible. Kids that can't do algebra, let's jump them to geometry and trig. Well, I couldn't get al past algebra, so I never got to do geometry. That was a mistake. Then you have the mathematical mind. That's, he thinks in patterns. And these guys don't Think in pictures quite the same way. See, in your brain, you have circuits for what is something. That's me in the extreme. Then you also have circuits in the brain for where are you located in space? Where is something? And these kids often have trouble with reading. And there's too much emphasis in special ed on the deficit and not enough emphasis on building up the area of strength. Where would Einstein go today? Would he be uh, in the basement addicted to video games today? I'm seeing too many young people where that's happening. They're not going into great jobs in the video game industry. They're playing video games. Now, let's look at the kind of jobs for the different kinds of minds. Okay, my kind of mind, photography, a whole field called industrial design. I'd be very good at something like auto mechanics, diesel mechanics, fixing problems with electric wires. And I can tell you, those jobs are not going to get outsourced to China. There's a lot of jobs that take the two-year community college degree. And let me tell you, stupid people can't fix things like substations. Well, you like electricity, don't you? Well, those things are going to have to work. Pattern thinkers, they're your programmers, your engineers, your mathematicians. And then another kind of mind is very good with words. And I think we've got to start thinking about college majors and stuff like, what are you going to do when you finally get out? I did a lot of job-related things. When I was 13, my mother got me a sewing job. When I was 15, I was cleaning eight horse stalls every day and basically running a horse barn. I also went out to my aunt's ranch, and I had to wait on a few tables there, too. You know, seeing too many kids not learning sort of the discipline of having a job. And then I had an internship at a research lab. It was actually the Worcester Foundation for Experimental Biology, where I had to rent my own house, live with another person. You see, you've got to take these kids that are kind of different, and you've got to stretch them. Surprises cause panic. You can't just chuck them in the deep end of the pool. But if you don't stretch them, then they don't develop. And people can be mixtures. And then there's some people with dyslexia where they're a great auditory learner. They learn everything through their ears. Now you might think I'm telling you a pile of rubbish about the different kinds of minds. Well, here is scientific evidence on this slide. You know, Marie Kosanoff, 
Harvard and uh, the Angelica Mazard PET scan studies. And these references are in my autistic brain book. And um, I think they're going to have those for sale afterwards. I will be out there. And these things really are real. And when these kids get labels, they tend to be more extreme on this stuff. OK, just want to show you there's two ways to do the math, the verbal way and the visual spatial way. Well, right now in the schools, they're saying kids have got to show their work. Well, some of these kids can just do it in their head. There's no work to show. And they're just you know, going to go nowhere if you force them. I think a lot of people have a hard time kind of getting the idea through their head that people do think differently. Now, if the kid's able to do it in his head, I'm, I'm going to take some precautions against cheating. I've got to make sure they don't have some electronic thing in their pocket that they're cheating with. So I take all that stuff away. And once I rule that out, then OK, let him do it in his head. I think in education, we've got to get a lot more into outcomes. What's the outcome of education? Get and keep good jobs, stay out of trouble with the law, be a contributing member of society. That's what education is really all about. And I developed a system for measuring animal welfare at meatpacking plants. It's an outcome-based system. I don't tell you how to build stuff, but you're only allowed three cattle bellering their heads off in the, in the plant. More than three cattle out of 100 beller their heads off, then you're going to fail the McDonald's on it. It's just that simple. It's outcome-based. Cattle are bellering their heads off. It's because you're doing something nasty to them. All right, I want to give you a glimpse into the mathematic mind. This praying mantis is made out of a single sheet of folded paper. No cutting, no tape. What you see in the background, that is the folding pattern. Pretty cool, isn't that? That's certainly not my mind. And there are some great little origami stars that some kids uh, gave to me. Well, they're little mathematicians. And here's a, another one of my drawings. I always like to show my drawings off. And kids need to be putting together a good portfolio. I'll have uh, you know, someone had come up to me in an autism meeting, and they said they're trying to get into graphic design or something like that. I said, show me your portfolio. Well, you need to have your portfolio on your phone. You need to have it with you. Because one thing I figured out very early on, you never know who might come around you can show it to. Who can open the door? I talked to a fascinating lady last night on the plane and, uh, that makes, uh, uh, works in the medical device field. They make the uh, corneal implants for um, uh, you know, so people can see when they get uh, cataracts. She was telling about all the developing countries they were going to and, and stuff. Uh, well, you sit next to somebody like that and you have your portfolio, you might not end up getting a job. And when you're kind of a weird geek, you need to have your work there to show off. Now, this is a picture done by Jessie Park. She's got autism, and I'd say more at the moderate level. Now, one of the things that had to be done with Jessie is she had to learn how to do art that other people want. And you know what her favorite thing used to be? Electric blanket control pictures. <laughs> Don't think most people want that. So she had to learn to do pictures that people would actually want and buy. See, people on the spectrum tend to get fixated on their favorite things. If the kid likes trains, you know, the things that move, trains and planes, tend to be favorite things. My favorite things were kites and model airplanes. OK, let's do math. Let's calculate how long it takes a plane to fly to Chicago at a certain speed. You know, let's um, read about the history of aviation. You know, let's broaden it out. Use the motivation of that fixation. To, to motivate doing other subjects. And here's a beautiful picture that Grant Monnier made. His mother helped him develop his skills. And he was showing his art in, in just autism meetings. And I said, this art is good enough to show professionally and sell professionally. And she went to a professional art show. I think she went to a show in Dallas or Houston and did really well. Now, Grant's somebody that's probably going to have to live in a supervised living situation, just like Jesse does. But um, they're selling an art on the regular commercial market. All right, now I'm going to show you why all you algebra fanatics out there need to have my kind of mind on the design team. All right, we got a real mess there that you don't want to get near. That is the remains of the Fukushima nuclear power plant. And when I found out why these reactors melted down, I go, how could you make this mistake? 
And the thing is, the mathematician mind doesn't see things the way I do. I can't design a nuclear reactor. All I know about a nuclear reactor is if the emergency cooling pumps don't work, I'm in so much trouble it's not funny. It's not a very good idea when you live next to the sea to put those emergency cooling pumps and all the electric boards and all your emergency generators in a non-waterproof basement. I'm not kidding. That is why I think it was three reactors melted down and had total loss of containment. Uh, this was an absolute mess. The other problem is the Japanese operators never asked for help either. That also added to the mess. But the kind of job that I'd be capable of doing is drawing the concrete work up for this plant. Doing your side elevations, and I would have been going, oh, ye gads, I'm below grade here. I better buy some uh, waterproof doors. I would have been on the phone to shipbuilding companies, get me all the catalogs for waterproof doors. And if they had had that, and maybe some sump pumps, you live around here, you know what sump pumps are for basements, you know, like a little bit bigger version of this, this would not have happened. And you see, this is why we need the different kinds of mines. You know, you had airbags out there killing babies. Well, they followed a spec blindly that had to hold in an adult male with uh, no seat belt. Well, okay, guy, you better do up your seat belt because it's impossible to design an airbag that's not going to kill children otherwise. Okay. Now, Steve Jobs, when he was like uh, messing around, um, he got fascinated with calligraphy. Now, Steve Jobs was an engineer. He, it, Steve Jobs was not an engineer. See, I tend to be a little dyslexic and reverse things. He was not an engineer. He was an artist. We need the art mind. So every time you use your smartphone, an artist made that interface. Then the engineers had to make the inside of the phone work. See, this is an example of the different kinds of minds working together. We need to have the different kinds of minds. Now, some people have said the humanities are kind of worthless. And, you know, when I went, to, I went to college, up at Franklin Pierce College, and I'm going, I was a psychology major, why do I have to take this stupid world literature course? Well, it turned out being my favorite class. No, and I thought this was a really good statement made by David Baresh, 2013, in the Chronicle of Higher Education. The connection between Steve Jobs and so-called useless humanity programs, such as calligraphy, should not be ignored. We do need all the different kinds of minds. And there are some states, I'm not going to say which state, but two years ago I went and did a big convocation and found out that in this state they wanted to charge more tuition at the state university for humanities than for um, you know, other engineering or some kind of uh, thing like that, or business. Now on the other hand, I think some humanities majors are getting way too narrow. Okay, humanities major, you better be really good at writing. You better be really good at public speaking so that when you get out, you've got some skills that you can do outside your major. Now, there's some evidence that teaching the classic literature, not the kind of rubbish you can buy at the airport, but the real classic literature actually can help people have better social skills. This is an article published in Science. You know, Science, that's a real premier journal. Now, in my work with livestock, I noticed that cattle were afraid of a whole lot of little things that people don't notice. Like a chain hanging down, people walking by, a car parked next to a facility, a reflection, uh, it's too dark. Visual detail. Animals are sensory-based learners. They're not word-based learners. They are into visual detail, smell detail. Think how much the dog learns when he checks out the local fire hydrant. That's like going out to the um, coffee shop. He knows who's a friend or foe. You know, did the big bad bully go by here? Are there any girlfriends around here? There's a lot of information on that hydrant. Now, I talked about sensory. How many people here, I want to see if you're really good at visual things, notice that that animal is looking at the sunbeam? Oh, well, we're not doing very good on observation here. You see, this is where... I found if you get, do things like remove that sunbeam, then the cattle are going to go through the facility a whole lot better. That is visual detail. Okay, look at how the horse and the zebra have an ear on each other, and the other ear is looking at me. You see, this is detail. You see, when you think in words, you tend to overgeneralize. 
People that think totally in words tend to abstractify things too much. No, we need to be getting a lot more into the details. Now, this shows infants going into a meatpacking plant. Don't worry, I'm not going to show you any gross meat pictures. You can go look at beef plant video tour with Temple Grandin. <laughs> and um, you'll see how the meatpacking plant works. But I always get asked, do the cattle know they're going to get slaughtered? Well, I found they behave the same way at the meatpacking plant as they behave going in the veterinary chute. Yes, there's some stress, but the level of stress is about the same in both places. It can range from high to low, depending on how well they do their handling. Well, they don't like going into the dark, and they've got white translucent panels there. That's really good. But what a lot of people don't notice is they've got three people standing right where they should not be standing. And when I show this slide to my students, only about half of them see the people standing there. You see, sometimes the most obvious is the least obvious. It's just like putting that emergency equipment in that non-waterproof basement. That is something that was so obvious to me. Now, in human beings, there's evidence that language covers up sensory-based thinking. Because if there's a certain type of Alzheimer's, that as the language parts of the brain are destroyed, art talent comes out. And when Van Gogh was painting Starry Night, I don't think he realized he was putting mathematics in it. And when I read about this, I thought, oh, man, that's really, really cool. OK, this is an important slide. I'm a bottom-up thinker. Concepts are learned with specific examples. We need a lot more of this. Everything is learned by specific examples. You take the puzzle pieces and put them together. We need a lot more bottom-up thinking in Washington, DC. One of my big concerns right now is we've got too many young people coming out with a degree in something like public administration. I hope you don't have a, that degree here, because I'm going to bash it right now. I'm going, you mean I can actually get a degree in bureaucracy? And about 15 years ago, somebody put a sign on my office, in my office, that had been through the fax machine. You probably don't even know what a fax machine is. But this had gone around every office in the country. And it said, administratium the heaviest element known to man. It has an atomic weight of some astronomical amount. And the thing is, it reacts with nothing because it's inert. <laughs> we got to make sure we don't get turned into administratium. And I don't know where the sign came from, and I haven't looked up administratium on the internet. I probably need to do that. And let's look at specific examples in the disability community that have worked. Look up Walgreens the drug company warehouse program. And they have people with all different disabilities uh, working in the warehouse. Look at things like wheelchair basketball in the last uh, you know, summer Olympics. That's people doing things. Let's get into much more emphasis. I was just down at Lubbock, Texas, um, at the Burkhart Center in Lubbock, Texas, and I found out about a Down syndrome girl that has been trained to set up surgical instruments for heart surgery, and they love her. They say she's absolutely precise, she's really nice, and she doesn't gossip. And the <laughs> hospital absolutely loves her. OK, these are the sort of success stories that we want to kind of duplicate this. You see, this is not thinking in abstractions. I'm thinking more in specific examples. All right, so if I've got to teach a kid a concept like going up, I've got to use lots of different specific examples. Up the hill, I lift up the cup. The plane flew up in the air. I put a box up on the shelf. My thinking is associative, not linear. See, most if you think in words, you tend to be very linear. And you lots of times have a hard time, you know, you think of the whole thing about thinking outside the box. People tend to get too much in their silos. I want to bust out of silos. So I make a point in my speaking engagements to, to like, take a variety of different things. I'll do gifted conferences, I'll do cattle stuff, um, I've done I've, I've been to Google, I've been to Pixar, I've been to Disney Imagineering, love to go do tech stuff. And those are the happy um, people on the mild end of the autism spectrum. You know, do something, you know, doing the movie was really interesting. Uh, yeah, I know some directors and stuff in Hollywood that I know are on the spectrum, but I do not talk about the live ones. Only the dead ones will I diagnose. <laughs> I'll diagnose them after they die, not before. I can think of some heads of some big tech companies that I know are on the spectrum. You know, look up their interviews online, you know. <laughs> now, when I look at the United Airlines Concourse B, 
I can start going into my mind either into a glass structure category, just like Google for Images. Who do you think made Google for Images? Or an airport category. There are no generalized pictures. If I say, think about a church steeple, how does it come into your mind? I see specific ones. I was shocked to find out like 25 years ago that someone goes, oh, pointy thing? You know, get a very, very abstract church steeple. So glass structures. I got the biosphere in Arizona, the Crystal Palace. I've got our greenhouse at Colorado State. Now I'm thinking about our building that's under construction. Now another picture is coming into my mind of when they were working on our, on our behavioral science building. The construction company took up about 20 of our super valuable parking spaces with the trailers. You know, that, you see how my mind is, you see, you see how I got to that. It's not random. It is associative. Or I can get into an airport category. Denver International Airport. Let's think about things like big amounts of money. I think it's stupid to talk about big amounts of money and like how many dollar bills it would take to go to the moon. That's not stupid. Nobody can relate to that. When we talk about big amounts of money, let's talk about it in something we can understand. When they did the stimulus money in 2008, it was equal to two Denver airports for every state. Buys the land, the runways, everything except things that drive and things that fly. Everything else included. Security, air traffic control, all the runways, all the land, power, water, terminal building, all the jet bridges, all, all of the airport infrastructure. Where does that money go? Two airports for every state. You see, let's take these big amounts of money and budgets and convert it to something I can actually relate to. So, okay, I can get in the airport category. Dallas, Fort Worth, Minneapolis, Atlanta. Man, what a joke. I was down there, two and a half inches of snow. What a joke. <laughs> oh, the governor, I was watching, I was in a super nice guest house. I'm really glad I was there. Not stuck in that mess. The governor was saying, truckers stay out of, uh, out of Georgia. I mean, that was ridiculous. And then you got LaGuardia. You know, some people call that airport the garbage. And, <laughs> but I, I picked out this picture to be my LaGuardia picture because this building just kind of fascinates me. You know, it might be really fun airport, old airport antique junk in there. It'd be fun to explore. Now, when I asked a physicist about church steeples, trippy man. He didn't get pictures or words. He got motion of people swaying and singing and praying and standing and kneeling. Trippy man. That's not my mind. <laughs> you know, I really like these different kinds of minds because I like to think about how the different kinds of minds can work together and complement each other when you realize that different people have different kinds of skills. I had a student one time that was good at everything I was bad at. She could run all the statistics programs, super meticulous on collecting data. But when it came to creative ways of sorting data and analyzing it, that's where I had to step in. Now, cattle are very specific. You need to teach cattle that a man on a horse is good, and you teach them that a man walking on the ground is good. See, it's a different picture. You've got to train them to both. You know, working with some of these kids, you know, I've got especially some of the more severe ones. Uh, things are very specific. It doesn't generalize. See, when you're sensory-based, it doesn't generalize the same way. Okay, we're trying to figure out a problem. Do we have something wrong with a piece of equipment or something wrong with the design of the equipment? Do we have a behavior problem with a kid? Is it biology, like maybe it's sensory oversensitivity, or is it psychology? Top-down thinkers tend to overgeneralize and go, what are we going to do about autism? That's way too generalized. People ask me these top-down questions all the time. My kid has behavior trouble in the classroom. I wouldn't even begin to answer that. How could I answer that? I don't know the age. I don't know what he did. I don't know anything about it. That's overgeneralization. Too much um, top-down thinking gets you in trouble. And programmers have a, ter a term called dog fooding. And what dog fooding is, is when you got to use the things that you actually make, use the programs you actually make. Is it going to work? Okay, health care is a big issue. Well, what does this program do to Susie that lives over here in this trailer park? What about this guy over here that works for the tech company out on 128? What about this college professor? You know, let's start looking at it in a more specific way. Now, it's okay to be eccentric. I visited the Jet Propulsion Lab, really, really cool place. 
and the guy with the long hair is my age. He was a theater major originally. Now he's the navigator for the Mars rover. You know, so you know, people can get into careers with different paths. What this brings up is, if you don't show kids interesting stuff, they don't get interested in it. How did I get interested in cattle? Because my mother got remarried when I was 14, and that brought the ranch into the family. And then my mother, I want, my mother wanted me to go out to the ranch in Arizona. And I was afraid to go. She wouldn't let me not go. She gave me a choice. One week or all summer. <laughs> I give these kids choices. And one place my mother drew a line in the sand, and my high school drew a line in the sand, is no being a recluse in the room. I'm seeing too many of these kids turning into video game recluses. And they're not going anywhere. You know, people think I'm an old fogey. But if they were getting great jobs in the video game industry, I would feel a little differently about it. Now, the thing is, I found that looking at things was more interesting than looking at people. Well, you can need some people interested in things. Okay, when the, flood, when the substation for the electric power floods in New York, you want somebody very interested in things to fix that for you. Yes, you go by those substation things where all the wires come into those big transformer things. You better love those places because you won't have any power if those things don't work. It's that simple. Unless you got some solar panels. Okay, one of the things we can do to help kids succeed, you got to stretch them just outside their comfort zone, but no sudden surprises. Another thing, these kids are the kind of different mentors. I had a fabulous science teacher. There's a lot of retirees that are getting bored. You know, you know, maybe get some old lawnmowers and have these 12 year old boys fix engines. Because if they don't get exposed to that, they don't find out that they're going to like it. Also, kids have got to learn work skills. This needs to start around 12 or 13. And I wish the Boston Globe still had paper routes, because I'd put all these kids on it. Let's figure out substitutes. How about walking dogs? How about working in a farmer's market? I'm going to call these paper route substitutes. They've got to learn that discipline of having a job that needs to start around 13 years old. I'm seeing too many kids graduating from college to get a degree in something like philosophy, never done a single work skill. That's totally, totally bad. Also, kids are not doing uh, free play anymore. A lot of kids, even normal kids, don't know how to do free play. I talked to this fascinating lady that has an organic farm, and she has 40 11 and 10 year olds come out to her place to camp. And this is the first time that they could do free play, explore a 10 acre walnut orchard. And for the first two days, they don't know what to do. And they're moping around because they take all the video games and phones away. And then these kids find out that free play is fun. But it also teaches you negotiation, getting along with other people. I think one of the worst things that schools have done is taking out the hands-on classes. Absolutely terrible. Totally a worse thing. These classes like cooking, sewing, art, music, woodworking, welding, drafting, they also teach practical problem-solving skills. You know, the thing is, in the real world, things can't be perfect. We have a huge shortage. Auto mechanics, people to fix the electrical wires when they break, a lot of these skilled trades. Huge shortage. Well, this is the kind of classes that saved me when I was in high school. Horseback riding, building things. And when I was in high school, I did a really nice job of making our ski tow house pretty. Didn't do much studying, but boy, I sure was le uh, learning the work skills. Well, I think I'm going to be getting behind here. Uh, I think hopefully I've got to rush now. You know, I think we need to be limiting the screen time. Uh, the other thing is, okay, let's say the kid's hung up on Minecraft. Let's try to get that into other things. First of all, let's have them do Minecraft assignments where you've got to build something that's an assigned task. Things like robotics clubs. You've got to learn how to do assigned tasks. One mom made wooden blocks and had the kids paint them, and they did Minecraft in the driveway. You see, I want to get the electronic world tied back to the physical things. Some kids do just great with showing animals. Build on the area of strength. I cannot emphasize that enough. My ability in art was always encouraged, but I was encouraged to do lots of different things. You want to broaden those fixations. And there's great online resources. Code Academy, Udacity, free programming classes, Wolfram Mathematica, and when I was in high school, I saw a science movie, and I got all turned on about optical illusion rooms. 
See, this brings up the whole thing. If you've got to show kids interesting stuff, to get them interested in interesting stuff. And here's one of my drawings in SketchUp. Free drawing program. All this great stuff online. But you need to have mentors to guide it. The other thing is kids have got to learn to do assigned tasks. Because when you grow up and you have a job, you don't get to play. You've got to sometimes do some grunt work and some drudgery and do assigned tasks. And here's a really neat thing, 3D printers. Really cool thing because it connects the, the computer world to the real world. And I thought it was interesting what MakerBot put on their website. Warning, it requires patience. A lot of kids today don't have patience, know-how, and a sense of adventure. Because if you don't do it right, it prints you a pile of plastic goo. You're going to have to have some patience. And then you can make cool things like that, look at cool things through microscopes. There's all kinds of great stuff. All right, teaching reading. Interesting things. The hand is connected to the brain, and the eye is connected to the brain in a way that maybe the keyboard's not. And having kids actually hand print. Also, when people read to children, let's turn off all the gizmos, the, you know, the go to videos and things, because the kids look at those links and then they don't pay attention to the story. And this is where a paper book worked better than an electronic one. Now, I, they did not test plain electronic with no gizmos. I think that would work fine. But if they're looking at that link on there that they know goes to video, then they're not paying attention to the story. See, and these are journal articles. You know, we're really into evidence-based today. I'm making sure I'm giving you the evidence-based. And then out at Pixar, they found that they had to get them off the computers. Sometimes get back to the hand drawings because you got to build things. The thing I like about the 3D printers is when you print something out, you can actually touch it. And a lot of the people put all their little printouts next to the computer mouse so they can touch them. You've got to touch and see and feel to really see things right. And when the meat industry went from the hand drawings to the computer, they started noticing a lot of strange mistakes on drawings. They didn't know where the center of the circle was because they'd never built anything. They'd never drawn anything by hand. Mentors already talked about, you know, what we need to be doing on that. Well, we already talked about visualizing big sums of money. You know, people, kids have got to get some experiences in, in doing things. Okay, I'll just give you one example of experience. Okay, the bookstore hadn't originally planned to sell my books out there. I said, well, just do it. Get them to do it. Well, I can tell you one thing, being in the construction industry taught me, teaches you how to get stuff done. Simple. All right, you want to sell your work rather than yourself. So create a portfolio. So when you can show that to a prospective employer. You know, I was talking to a guy who was good at welding, and I said, why don't you make a really nice presentation briefcase with some welded little pieces of metal, pictures of jobs, you open that up, and people go, wow. Also, at, at work, I need to have specific goals, even now. When I worked on a project on some animal welfare guidelines, you know, we had a big meeting with 20 different people, and I said, okay, now give me some homework on some specific parts of this document that I'm supposed to write. And freelance work is often good. Avoids a lot of political problems. Now, the thing is, you know, weird geek, you know, you demonstrate how to do the job. Well, when I was eight years old, I had to be a little party hostess. That was good social training. Sort of like coaching in a play. I'm going to end up talking just briefly about some of the sensory problems that people are different than have. Maybe they can't tolerate too much noise, or they can't tolerate scratchy clothes or they can't tolerate um, uh, 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 fluorescent lights that flicker, the old-fashioned 60-cycle fluorescent lights. Now, do I go in there and tell the boss I got autism and all that stuff? No, I might just tell them that fluorescent lights give me a headache or I need a quiet place to work. Uh, and in the autistic brain, we got a lot more information on sensory issues. Now, I'm not supposed to be doing any questions in the audience, but I, I'm a silo buster. I'm going to take a few questions off the audience. We're going to be about five minutes uh, late. All right, somebody here in the front where I can hear you? Okay, come on, people. All right, uh, I'm going to pick somebody. Okay, green sweater right there. Okay, I guess, uh, all right, right here. All right, now the question came up. Let me just repeat this. Go to, well, if you ask for directions, the negative stigma come up. That's getting into a lot of PC talk. 
You know, the way I dealt with that is, is I just, okay, now I want to find out what the outcome of the work is. Okay, a good boss, okay, you don't just say to somebody, well, develop new software. You give them an assignment to do some specific thing. And, and uh, you know, you just, uh, you know, when I was uh, doing advertising and things like this, I said, okay, what am I supposed to be advertising? Tell me what the outcome is, when the deadline is. Um, you know, you don't have to go into all this minutia about, um, you know, you've got autism or something like that. I just say things like, I do better with written instructions. Give me a chance to write down exactly what you want me to do. I do not remember sequence well. I don't tell them I don't remember sequence well. I just say, look, I just like to write it down. Okay, we're designing this project for this meat packing plant. It has to be this budget, this many people. Here's the site restrictions. No, you cannot rip out the railroad track. You know, I, you know it's so that I know what the parameters are. Or I can say I need a quiet place to work. If you stick me in an open cube, I'm not going to do very good work because if everybody's walking by me to go to the bathroom, that drives me crazy. You know, just, uh, that's the way you do it. You know, the thing is, I learned to sell my work. People don't care how weird you are. Your stuff's good enough. And there's a scene in the movie where my boss slammed down the deodorant and said, you stink, use it. At the time, I was furious. Now I thank that boss. You know, it's not a matter of just accepting you how you are. Sometimes you've got to kind of come halfway on things. Being eccentric is fine. Being a slob is not okay. Okay, another question. Okay, right there. Make it quick. Oh, I can't hear you. How many jobs have I had? I worked freelance. So I basically worked for every single one of the major meat companies. And uh, my first job I ever had, I was livestock editor for the Farmer Ranchman magazine. And I started up doing it voluntary. And then we got a new boss who thought I was really weird and he wanted to get rid of me. And the nice graphics lady, Susan, said to me, well, this new boss, Jim, thinks you're really weird, wants to get rid of you. Let's get a scrapbook together of all your articles. So I got a scrapbook together of all my articles. And when I showed it to Jim, I got a raise. <laughs> I, you know, I built up my business one little job at a time. You know, make a good portfolio, but don't put too much rubbish in your portfolio. When you show that to an employer, you want like five really good things in it. And the other thing is, you got to show the right stuff. I talked to one lady, she did weird science fiction art, and she had a weird web page. And when she wanted to do some commercial art for car dealerships and banks, they didn't go over very well. And I said to her, why don't you just buy another domain name, they're only $35 a year, start another web page with a totally different domain name for what's going to be a regular commercial art. And so you know, that those clients don't even get into the weird stuff. Okay, right there. How what? I can't hear. How did autism affect, positively affect my life? Um, well, I'm an extreme visual thinker, which makes me good at certain things other people are not good at. Um, you see, that's almost too vague of a thing. You see, my sense of identity is hung up in being a college professor and what I do. I am what I do. You see, and I worked in construction for 20 years, and boy, I can tell you, there were lots of dyslexics. I know people that are dyslexic. They build these big, complicated feed mills. Um, I know some metal fabricators that I know are on the autism spectrum, I, and they were saved by the welding class. Uh, I think a little more emphasis on what you can do. Let's go back to the um, people playing wheelchair basketball. Yeah, they, they, I'm a basketball player, I'm an athlete. And that's a really fun game to watch. Okay, one super quick one right there, and then we'll go, I'm getting a big hint here. Let's do this. All right. Because to classes, so if you're a student and you need to leave, why don't we go ahead and dismiss you now? But if you'd like to stay and we have a little more question and I'll answer, be happy is that? To do okay, that's great. I'll be happy to do that. Okay. Well, we can take a few more questions, and then I'll sign out, sign books. I'll be happy to do that. Um, 
Okay, right there. Okay, wait a minute. Let's just wait until some of these people, some of the noise gets uh, stopped here. Yeah, we want, we want to keep the conversation. Okay, we got it. We want to keep the conversation. No, I realize that. I'm aware of that. Yeah, they got to get out the classes. Well, maybe we ought to just, maybe we ought to just cut it off. It looks like those people. I think, it, it might, I think it would still be helpful because if you do it immediately, some of them may not have the time. All right, yeah, time. okay. Okay, maybe we could ask, could you maybe ask them to be quiet. Why don't we, um... Maybe we could ask them to be quiet. So yeah, the, the way they're leaving, it's, they're... You can ask them to be quiet, though. Yeah, it's not going to work. Um, so we're going to keep the question and answer going. Uh, students that are leaving, if, if you could uh, try your best to just be quiet so that uh, Ms. Granny can hear the question, that would be great. Thanks. Okay, you had a question right here. All right, the question was, um, you know, want to reform education, want to be doing homeschooling or education reform. You're asking about that almost too abstract. You're getting into too much top-down thinking here. You know, there are situations where homeschooling works really well. Some of the people out in Silicon Valley finding the Montessori approach is working very well with some of these, you know, the geeky kind of nerds and they're avoiding, then they can avoid the, the autism label. Um, it's not so simple as one size fits all. You know, one, one of the things I've found is education is the absolute worst on just getting off on fads. When I was in college, they were totally into the teaching machine fad. Look that up, 1960s B.F. Skinner teaching machine fad. It was a pile of rubbish. When I was in college, they thought that was going to save education. Get out and see lots of stuff, lots of different stuff. Try to do a little more bottom-up thinking. Okay, right there. Seen any what with high-functioning autism? Brain types. Well, basically, when you look at brain scan data, the thing that seems to be kind of a core problem are some of the social circuits are not hooked up for things like face recognition and picking up, you know, subtle facial expressions. Those things have to be learned, like being in a foreign country. Like, for example, if I went to the Middle East and I put the sole of my shoe up and showed you the sole of my shoe, that's like super rude, and I'm not going to do it because somebody might be videoing this. I wouldn't want somebody in the Middle East to, to see the, like, the equivalent of a really nasty swear word, so I'm not going to do it. But I would have no way of knowing that that's rude unless somebody told me. And this is why, why things like my mother having me be party hostess when I was eight years old, teaching me how to shake hands, was something that was just so helpful. Okay. Um, I'm dyslexic, and I've always kind of struggled with how to better communicate with my peers, like in terms of communicating and just my perception of other people. How have you learned certain ways to better communicate with peers? How did I learn better to communicate with peers? You've got to remember, when I was young, there were no books on any of these things. So if you have some of the problems with eye contact, picking up subtle social cues, well, I have a book called The Unwritten Social Rules that might help you. The other thing that helped me was getting involved with peers with like-minded interests, you know, like people interested in art, people interested in horses, people interested in the cattle industry. You know, that's where I had most of my friends. When I was in high school, I had model rockets, horses, and electronics. And the students that were interested in those things were not the students, there were no, none of the bullies were there. You see, uh, get involved with, um, you know, with people that you can get along with. I had to learn things like not to just endlessly go on and on and on talking about my favorite things. I had kind of a rule, tell that same story only twice. That's all you can tell it. Uh, like, what are you good at? In other words, you're an auditory learner, and you're going to learn through working. Maybe you'd be good as a counselor of some type, and because that would use your auditory skills. You know, the thing I've noticed about career stuff is that if there's any career flexibility, let's say you're hired by a big corporation, people tend to drift into the area that matches their skill. 
Uh, and and uh, you know, they may start at one job, kind of hate it, and drift into something else. And in other situations, you're just trapped in a job that you know, isn't really a career. You know, do a low-level retail associate. You know, that's, uh, but in some of those retail companies, you can work up. You know, one thing about big corporations, there's lots of room to work up. See, people lots of times don't see the door. You know, you meet the right people, they can open up a door. You know, you probably need to be in a job where you can put your auditory skills to work. You know, you're not going to be doing industrial design. Stuff that I've done with the livestock, that's a field called industrial design. Okay, right here. Well, some people with autism, as I said, there's three kinds of minds. There's the visual thinkers like me, who think in pictures. There's more of the mathematical minds, and there's some that definitely are better at words. And these are the kids that tend to love history, love facts about their favorite subjects. Those are the ones that are the word thinkers. Okay, right here, blue scarf. Okay, the question concerns when do you limit special interests and when do you indulge? What you want to try to do with special interests is broaden them. When I was in fourth grade, all I wanted to do was draw the same horse head over and, again, over, and over and over again. I was encouraged to draw lots of different things. You know, endless video game playing, we've got to limit that because I'm finding that that's not going anywhere. I'm seeing kids labeled autism, they get a disability diagnosis, and they're getting a social security check to play video games all day. That makes me crazy. And then I go visit a tech company and the same geek is there and he's not playing video games all day. You know, people are saying I'm just being an old fogey, but that's not a good outcome. And, and give me a more specific example of the limited interest. He's in a Minecraft. All right, let's take that. Well, Minecraft's a building game. So maybe, let's maybe introduce him to some other drawing programs, like SketchUp. The other thing is, when you work at a job, you have to do an assigned task. Well, you can do, make things on Minecraft where it's an assigned task. You know, you can't, when you're working at work, you see, the thing about a job, is there's parts of a job that are fun, even the best jobs, but there's also parts of jobs that are just pure drudgery. Like when I started out the fire ranchman, there's nothing fun about writing up show and sale results. Just a bunch of lists. But that's part of the job. And you've got to learn, kind of learn that discipline of a job that along with the fun stuff, there's some stuff that's not, not so fun. Okay, standing in security line at the airport's not fun, but that's something that you have to do. You know, that's part of the job. And he's got to learn it. How old is your son? He's eight. Okay, he's a little bit too young for a job outside. Though. When he gets to be about 13, we need to find a paper route substitute for him. But I want to broaden that Minecraft interest out. Why don't you go to the lumberyard and cut up a bunch of two-by-fours, invite his friends over, and we're going to paint them in the Minecraft colors and do Minecraft in the driveway. And one mom did that and they were playing old-fashioned blocks, free play, except it was Minecraft blocks. See how I'm making a tie-in to the Minecraft? I'm not gonna, and I'm gonna limit, can't let an eight-year-old spend eight hours a day on Minecraft, you just can't. I mean, I didn't spend eight hours a day drawing. You know, they, and the other thing is, let's teach manners, be it meals, manners, had to sit through church whether I liked it or not. You know, there you sometimes just gotta do some stuff other people, you know, gets into the whole turn taking. How's your son at how are your sons at turn taking in board games? All right, well see we've got to be doing turn taking stuff. The eight year old probably getting a little old for ABA now. You know, we need to be um, doing other things, but I want to broaden out that interest. Okay, what does he make on Minecraft? Have you ever looked at any of this stuff? Okay. Because he's got to learn how to do assignments. Okay, then maybe we can figure out a way to work math into Minecraft. You know, and there's a lot of stuff on the internet about that. How uh, maybe you can use it in teaching. Because you've got to start learning how to broaden something out. Okay, what are you building on Minecraft? What is it? What does he build on Minecraft? Houses? Okay, well, let's start branching out into some commercial drawing programs. SketchUp is free. 
That's a free program. It's called SketchUp. It's a free program. Let's start doing some houses on that. Let's start doing some assigned tasks because that's starting to teach job skills. Okay, right there. Right there. Most fun thing that I do, some of the most funnest stuff I ever did was building something and then seeing it work. That was some of the most funnest stuff. In other words, to see something I drew turn into a real project that worked. I can remember when the dip fat worked, that thing with the metal plate actually happened. Well, we took that out and then things worked. But when you have a job that works, you know, some of the most funnest parts of my life actually have been some of the stuff I did in the construction industry. Okay, right there. Yes, I dream in pictures. Yes, definitely. Okay. What, well, the most complicated thing ever designed or? Well, I designed a thing for the meat plant called the Center Track Restrainer System, and you'll see how that works, beef plant video tour. I also have a website, grandon.com. Got a lot of stuff in that, you know, things that I've designed. I've got lots of papers, too, on, on a lot of these things, okay? Well, I mean, I, when I first started out, I, you know, I've been able to achieve a lot of things. I, you know, I probably uh, wouldn't have imagined that. Now, people are always looking for the single magic turning point. There isn't one. It's a steady, you keep learning more and more and more. It's a steady progression. The other thing I want to emphasize, lots of hard work. It was not easy. I also have a book called Different Not Less, and it's 14 old people that got diagnosed with Asperger's later in life that all had careers, all had supported themselves all their lives. And that's where the diagnosis gave them insight into their relationships. I think in some cases, on the mild end of the spectrum, the diagnosis is holding people back. You go, poor little Aspie, um, he doesn't have to learn how to order his food at a restaurant. And I go, yes, he does. By the time I was eight years old, I knew how to do that. I even was taught you look down at the prices and you don't order something twice as expensive than what the whole host orders. You know, that was taught to me. You see, I think one thing that helped in the 50s with the mild dyslexics and Asperger kids is the social manners were just pounded into kids in the 50s. And that's not done today. And a lot of these kids are kind of getting coddled and overprotected. But again, no sudden surprises, but you have a choice. My mother said I could go to the ranch for all summer, or I could go to the ranch for a week. But not going was not going to be a choice. And when I went away to a special boarding school after getting kicked out of ninth grade for fighting, I didn't want to go to this Friday night movie night because I was nervous. So Mr. Patey, the headmaster, gave me a choice. I could be in the audience or I could be the projectionist. But not going was not going to be a choice. And I chose to be the projectionist. Okay, in the back. Okay, you said something about how to get friendships. Oh yes, I've got quite a lot of friendships. And a lot of the friendships started through shared interests. I have a lot of friends in the cattle industry. I've got friends, uh, you know, friends in, um, in autism. I've got friends in, like, that build things. You know, one of the best places to get friends when you're different is through shared interests. But you've also got to learn not to stick too much to the other person like glue. You know, because that, that can really bother people. Okay, right there. Yes, you, right there. My favorite what movie? Horse movie? Well, when I was a young kid, one of my favorite books was Black Beauty. And I had a really nice children's version of that. Another one of my favorite books is a, in elementary school is a book about famous inventors. And some of them were not the best students when they were younger. And I could, um, I could relate to that. Um, you know, they, they uh, you know, I had a lot of favorite movies. Uh, 
Okay, right there. That was a big Star Trek fan. Absolute Star Trek fan. Right there. Okay, let's talk about sensory issues because I had to kind of cut that part of the presentation short. And I'm going to just rush through actually some of the slides I didn't get around to showing. And let's just say a few things about sensory issues. Um, when I was a young child, loud sounds hurt my ears. Now, sometimes you can desensitize these things if the kid initiates the sound. In other words, he turns on the dreaded buzzer or microphone feedback. He takes a handheld mic and walks up to the speaker, and it just starts to squeal, and then he backs off. He controls it. Sometimes you can desensitize. I still have problems with scratchy clothes, and I find that some cotton t-shirts itch, others don't, and I really don't know why. And I have to wash all my things that go against my skin. I, but I, and I still have some problems with that, with scratchy clothes. I'm, you know, the sound sensitivity thing now for me is now just a nuisance. You know, one time I was stuck in the Denver airport and all the fire alarms went off in this big, long, skinny concourse, like around gate 90. And I ran down the concourse and then got to the next one, blasting me out. I mean, I tolerated it, but it was, uh, it was really bad. Another issue is attention shifting slowness, where it takes more time to shift back and forth, a um, little more time to process. When I was young, I remember getting very frustrated because they wouldn't give me time to answer a question. I remember one very frustrating uh, situation in kindergarten where we had a little picture book and I had to mark down all the things that began with B as in Bravo. And I didn't mark down the bicycle because I rode a trike. And I didn't know the difference between a trike and a bike. And the teacher wouldn't give me time to explain that. It was just so frustrating. And I didn't mark down the suitcase because we called them, well, I marked down the suitcase because we call them bags in our house. So that was a bag, and I wasn't given time to explain that we called those bags. And you hardly know the word suitcase. Another sensory problem that you can get is some dyslexics, they, when they go to read the print jiggles on the page, I'm finding that about one out of 50 students in my um, uh, 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 cattle handling class has this problem, because I have to, these students have to draw a drawing. These kids cannot draw. Now, this doesn't explain all dyslexia. And you see the print jiggle. And one of the simple things you can try for this is try printing the homework on different pale colored papers. Try some colored lenses. Now, you go out and you do refereed scientific journal, they're going to say it's a bunch of, you know, meta analysis shows it doesn't work. But the problem that we got here is we're mixing too many apples and oranges all together. But, they see, but there are students where a very simple intervention works. And wouldn't it be stupid to flunk out of school because you didn't get some light blue paper to print stuff on or, you, or make a light blue background on your computer? It'd be really dumb to flunk out of school because you didn't do that. You're talking about something so simple, stupid not to try it. It doesn't cost anything to try it. OK, um, okay right here. How do I feel about what? Well, I can tell you how I dealt with the algebra thing. You see, the thing is, once you get out in industry, a lot of, for the things that, I, I couldn't become a computer programmer. There's no way. But for the math things I needed, there were standard formulas um, uh, for hydraulics. Um, there were these books I bought. They were full of tables. And, and when you really get out there, you don't need to know that stuff. The other thing is all these word problems they have in physics. Nobody does that in a real job. I mean, if you're out there designing bridge trusses or something like that, you're using a few formulas that are standard things. And then you know those formulas. You're not doing all this other weird stuff. I also, different kinds of minds need to work together. You see, I can't design a nuclear reactor, but there's no way I would have put that emergency equipment in a non-waterproof basement. You see, and this wasn't a matter of engineers being stupid. When I was young, I used to say the engineers are stupid. I don't say that now. I'm now realizing that, especially after talking to that physicist, is that they're not going to see water coming over the seawall. You see, I can see that. Water filling, smash the louvers out of the generator room, and it's full of water two seconds later. You see, I see that. And the word thinkers and the real big math thinker doesn't see that. This is where we need different minds working together. This is one of the reasons why I use co-authors on my books, because I tend to ramble. 
So I need a verbal thinker to organize the thoughts. You see, that's different kinds of minds working together. Now, thinking in pictures, there was no co-author there. Betsy, my editor, about tore out her hair editing that book. OK, right there, blue shirt. Medication. Um, there's way too many drugs given out to little kids like candy. Way, way too much. And sometimes drugs are serious side effects. Now, I have a book, The Way I See It, that goes into detail about medications. Now, I take um, antidepressant medication because I had severe anxiety problems. And a little bit of antidepressant can sometimes really, really, really help on that. I know visual thinkers that are not autistic wear a dab of Prozac in the morning. Just a very small dose is keeping them off of drugs and alcohol. They'd be in the gutter if they weren't on a little bit of Prozac or Soloft. Uh, because that, as I went through my 20s, the panic attacks got worse and worse and worse and worse. And that's why I was eating all that yogurt and jello. And as soon as I went on the antidepressant, the colitis stopped, and I was no longer eating all that yogurt and jello. You see, a little bit of the right med. And us visual thinkers, we tend to be panic monsters. Also, some of the, um, of the uh, uh, math, math, mathematicians, too, just a little bit stops that. When you get too high a dose of an antidepressant, you're going to get agitation and insomnia. Not going to be able to sleep. Then there's way too many antipsychotics that's given out like candy. Those drugs have very bad side effects. Sometimes you need to use those drugs, but you've got to realize those are heavy artillery. Uh, you want to try one thing at a time. The other thing is, you try a med. It should have some wow. Like, oh, wow, this really works. You don't give out powerful medications to make them a teensy bit less hyper. That's not a good enough reason to give out a powerful med. Let's try things like exercise, fish oil supplements. They're starting to get some um, science behind it being good for the brain. Sometimes a special diet helps some people. You know, uh, that's maybe worth trying to some of those first. But then I was one of the ones where if I hadn't gone on medication, and I still take it now, I wouldn't be here now. I would have been dead from colitis. I wouldn't have had any insides left. OK, right here. How old is your son? And 15. Now, the thing I'm going to ask you, and he's, and he's doing things over and over again, is he getting better on these things? Well, I like to, you know, I would do things like watching a video on over. I think one of the reasons why a lot of people that are nonverbal tap things and smell things is there's vision and, see and hearing doesn't work very well. Well, there's three great books to read if you're working with some people that are nonverbal. And I'm not talking about little tiny kids, but, you know, older people that are nonverbal. Why do I jump? Uh, that's the first one. Uh, how can I talk if my lips don't move? These are written by nonverbal people that are typing independently. And they describe a really sensorily disordered world where seeing is breaking up like into mosaics. You know how when the satellite dish shakes, your TV gets all those weird, weird little squares? Well, can you imagine? That's called pixelation. Can you imagine if your visual system was pixelating like that all the time? And when it gets tired, it worsens. Hearing can be cutting in and out like a really bad mobile phone. And the touch taste and smell actually still work. Those senses, from a neurological standpoint, are a lot simpler, and they still work. And that's one of the reasons why they tap things and touch things and smell things, because that actually works. OK. Well, one of the things he needs to do, he does need to learn to terminate something. How does he do if you give him a, like a warning signal where he learns, well, this little tone, and then five seconds later, we're going to turn off the computer? In other words, he gets a warning before you turn it off. I wonder if that would work. Well, he may not know what four minutes is. Let's get something he can see, like a kitchen timer, you know, where the thing turns and you can actually see it. See, the way I learned time when I was a child, I didn't have digital clocks. Digital clocks, I think, are awful. Um, they had a big old school clock. And it had a, 
minute hand that went around. But then when the big hand moved, it would move like five clicks. So every minute, I could see that do a click like that. Then the next minute, the minute hand would go around and do another click. And that really taught me the passage of time. So maybe if you have something where, okay, we put the timer down there and you turn it, and he can see it run out of time, he knows he's got to get off the computer. That might help. Okay? What's more important, the content of how it's presented? Well, of course, some, I'll tell you some presentation methods that don't work with me. Long strings of verbal information, and I'm not allowed to write it down. That seems to be something kind of universal. I have got to take notes. In fact, my math professor used to say, why do you take so many notes? Because I couldn't remember it otherwise. Um, my, I mean, the end result is I want you to learn the material. Okay, so for you, what way do you, what, what way do you learn material best? You're, this is your auditory person then. All right, well, that, I had a student that was an auditory person, and then you, and, uh, maybe you need to get your books on audio tape. You might find that, or I guess it's not audio tape anymore, just on audio, because uh, you find that you learn better with that. You know, try to get more auditory ways to learn the material. Do you have any vision problems? But you tend to be an auditory learner. That's fine. You see, this is where there are different kinds of minds. And then maybe you need to go into a field of work where auditory, like, you know, counseling, uh, sales, these are all areas where an auditory person do really well. Okay, right there. He does what? What makes it worse? Processes slowly, okay. Well, you have to be given time to process slowly. What are you good at doing? How, how, how far along in school are you? What year in school are you? High school journey? Have you ever had a job? You're old enough to... How old are you? <laughs> are you still over 16? You need to be out in the regular economy. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of learning how to work before you graduate. There's a thing called Project Search, and they have a very, very, very intensive internship uh, what do you think you'd want to do? What do you want to do after you graduate? Like to do what? Sciences? Well, you see, the first thing that I would do, trying to counsel you, is I want to go through your transcripts, see what you're good at doing. Because the thing is, I ended up in a job where I used my visual skill. I designed things. I would troubleshoot problems with animals. That's using my visual skill. I also could write, you know, decently. I, you know, I was a journalist. That was the first one of the first real jobs I ever had. And there's some jobs where you have time to process slowly. Okay, if you're a journalist, you're there alone on your computer. You know, as long as you get your deadlines done, you've got time to write this stuff. I think we got to in education. You got to get a lot more into what's the person going to do when they grow up. I see we, people get antsy, we're going to take one more quickie, and then I'll be out there by the book table, okay? How, how did I deal with making a movie about me? Well, the lady that, that um, worked on the movie was the mother of an autistic child. She really wanted to have it be right, and I, people ask me all the time, how do I handle all this attention? I consider it a responsibility. Because I get emails and things from a lot of children that look up to me. Always got to be on my best behavior at the airport. 
And the only time I got mad at somebody at the airport is I was in the bathroom at the Denver airport, and this lady shoved an iPhone in my face as I came out of the toilet stall. And I'm going, not in the restroom. And I have to say, I was kind of, you know, grumpy about that. And, and I, you know, I want to see kids that are different succeed, because when I go into the different silos, and I go to the meatpacking plant silo or the metal fabrication silo, or journalists, I have been interviewed by journalists that I know are on the spectrum and are word thinkers. And, they're, and they've, they're getting, they've gotten and they've kept decent jobs. We've got to get a lot more outcome based on getting in and getting you know, work that you're going to enjoy and be able to support yourself. Um, and usually, when you're on the spectrum, the skills tend to be a lot more uneven. There tends to be an area of strength and an area of deficit. That tends to be the way it goes. And we've got to build on that strength on what could turn into a decent job. Well, I think we'll end it there, and I'll be out at the book table where we can talk some more. Thank you.